thank you all for being here. We are so excited to return for a second season of the seminars in the Howard and Sandra Benger Educational Series. Um, just to take a quick poll, raise your hand if you've been to one of our seminars before. Okay, one of our Bender seminars? We got one, okay. And raise your hand if this is your first. Oh, you're totally fine. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Well, we're so glad to see new faces. So for those of you who are new to the series, the Maryland Horse Foundation has partnered with the University of Maryland Extension to set, put on a set of seminars that are uh, relating to agricultural or equine industry topics. Past seminars have included pasture management, um, agricultural and social media marketing, equine nutrition, and equine sports turf grass management. These lectures are recorded and available on MarylandHorse.com. The next seminar will be May 8th on agritourism, featuring speakers Joanne Dawson and Renee Wilson. Um, if you're interested in coming, uh, registration can be found through MarylandHorse.com or by uh, scanning one of the QR codes on one of our flyers. Um, so this series would not be possible without the generosity of the Bender Family Foundation, University of Maryland Extension, and our speakers. So I'd like to thank everyone, everyone here who made this event possible tonight with a special shout out to Dr. Amy Burke and Jen Reynolds. And just a run through of the schedule before we get started, um, we'll kick off with a talk from Leslie Hoover and Sherry Wardell from Horizon Farm Credit, break for 15 minutes for refreshments where we'll do the drawing of the raffle, and then close with our final speaker, Dale Johnson. So without further ado, I'd like to give a warm welcome to our first speakers. Sherry Wardell has joined the Horizon Farm Credit team with over 10 years of accounting experience between financial reporting and tax preparation. Her tax experience has specialized in personal and small business returns, and she is a licensed preparer for the state of Maryland. She grew up in rural Pennsylvania and is excited to specialize in agriculture, returning to her rural roots. Leslie Hoover, has been with Horizon Farm Credit for over 10 years as an ag accounting officer and manager. Serving customers has allowed her passion for agriculture and accounting to merge. Her passion for both started on her family dairy farm and has continued as her career does. She's also a board member of the Intercollegiate Dressage Association and a steward for the Inter Interscholastic Equestrian Association. Welcome. Hi, I, as she mentioned, I'm Sherry Wardle and this is Leslie. As we go through, because I know taxes are everyone's favorite thing, feel mm -hmm. free to ask questions. We're here for you. So we're going to go through our presentation. Mm -hmm. And any questions you have, please feel free to raise your hand. And either Leslie and I will be more than happy to answer your questions. And that is us. First of all, I wanted to go over some dates for you to remember. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a partnership, S Corp, multi member, LLC, you need to file by March 15th. You need to request extension by March 15th and file with an extension by September 16th, 2024. So the last, the 26th of, the 16th of September is the last you can file with an extension. For single members, sole proprietors, C Corp and personal, you have to file by April 18th this year. Um, you have to request your extension by the 18th and then you'll have to October 15th, 2024 in order to file. Um, I wanted to start when they're talking about hobby farms versus full-time farms. Um, with the IRS, of course, they've been really pushing this. It was like a few years ago, they really went into making sure, because you can't do deductions if you're considered a hobby farm versus a full-time farm. So the IRS wants to see you making a profit. They want to see that you're actually making a business. So they, when you're doing it, you do the operation of activity in a business manner. Make sure that you do things every day, you take total account for everything, you spend the day doing it, it's not something you do in the evening. It's um, like having relaxation or enjoyment. If you just have horses and you ride them and instead make it look like that it's a business and you're doing it for profit. Um, put less time in it versus more time into it. It's more time and effort. They wanna see that type of thing as well because they wanna definitely see that you're actually making it into a business privately owned or you're doing it alone versus formal ownership? Do you have employees? Are you incorporated? Are you making those steps towards making it look like a business versus just a hobby or just a personal thing that you're doing? And like I said, the most important thing is you can't deduct expenses. I have a friend who has a hobby farm. I actually just did her personal taxes. And her husband's like, can I deduct anything? And I said, you don't make a profit. You have to sell something. You have to do something to make a profit. The RS is really, 
really come down on that, that you really have to show a profit. Because they're like, well, if you're not making a business, if you're not making a profit, how can you be deducting those expenses? Because then everybody would want to do a hobby farm and try to deduct those expenses, because it's not cheap to, as you know, to have animals. <laughs> so, and, and it's a lifestyle. Do any of you have any questions? Yes. They can be seasonal, they can be part-time. They're there, they're taking instruction from you. That's what we're talking about. The other part is, is when Sherry and I are saying you're making a profit, we're not saying that at the end of the day you have $10,000 after your expenses. We're saying that you're in this to hopefully have that $10,000 at the end of the day, but we all know that that is not always easy. Um, we're talking about before, you know, when you sit down and you're, taking track of your records, you actually have made an effort to sell something, to make profit, to uh, actually receive money for giving lessons, to receive money for boarding, to receive money for judging or stewarding, something in relation to an actual business activity, not just have you know, the backyard horses, if you will, like me. So. Yeah, they want to show that you're making a livelihood. Like you're doing this to make this your livelihood. It's not just something you're doing. And you can do, when you say seasonal, you can either do a 1099, which means you don't take any taxes, you just pay them cash, or you can do the W-2 where you're actually taking taxes. You can do it either way. But you do have to show that you have employees, that you're actually making that effort to make this into a business. And eventually, that's your livelihood. And that's what's important. And that's what the IRS is really looking for, for you in order to make it and it's to your benefit because, like I said, there's so many expenses with animals and farming and such that you would want to do it that way. And the other part, one of the reasons, when we were asked to come and speak, the reason Sherry and I picked this topic in particular is sometimes those uh, red flags that you hear us accountants talk about to avoid audits kind of come up. Well, equestrian automatically puts a small red flag up in terms of there are a lot of court cases out there with the IRS saying this is a hobby versus a business. So making sure that you're starting out from the right get-go is very important in order to make sure that you are taking full advantage of what's happening on your farm and business. Correct. Any other questions? Okay. Our next thing is record keeping is key and we put this in because both of us have had experiences where record keeping is not so great. <laughs> it's time to come do taxes. We get a box of receipts or no one knows what their expenses are. And this is also vital to also show that you're making for profit for a farm is that you can use all different type of software. You can use, there's like QuickBooks, there's all kinds of different ones besides them. Some people use Excel, and I do my personal finances, I do use Excel, or you can do a written ledger. You don't even have to use a computer if you don't want to. We have clients that don't even have computers. They mm -hmm. barely have a cell phone. <laughs> so yep. it's very important that you just keep track, and just keep track of everything, your receipts for your expenses, um, keep for at least five years. You know, you know to keep all your tax information for five years, and then you can shred it, but it's important to keep it for at least five years. And then to categorize each expense. Instead of saying, I don't know, for example, a certain feed or a certain, like I bought all this equipment. Well, what equipment did you buy? What did you use it for? That type of thing. Um, a capital expenditures list. Let's say you decided to buy a tractor or those type of things. Put that down on your list and how much you paid for it. So for depreciation and those sort of things that we can go ahead and look at that. And for me, it's very important to reconcile monthly. When we come or you go talk to your accountant or you do it personally and you don't reconcile, because when you do your taxes, you want to look at your cash flow and you want to see where your expenditures are versus your income. And if you haven't reconciled that in a couple of months and it comes to tax time, it's going to take you hours. Instead, it's so nice at the end of third, December 31st, you did your final reconciliation, boom, you're done. You get all your stuff, for all your W-2s, your 1099s, all the anything else that you need, your K-1s, boom, you can have your taxes handed to your accountant and you're done. Yeah. So it's just really key to keep really good records. It makes your accountant happy, it'll make your life easier. It's just so much better to do. Have your and before we, we'll go into some of the real easy categories to know about and some of the less <laughs> well-known ones on the next slide. But in that area where we're talking about written ledger, Excel, QuickBooks, things that are not business-like, the console of your truck. 
or the pockets or glove compartment of your vehicle, or a shoe box or a trash bag that you're just stuffing everything into. And we've had all. So. <laughs> yes, my first year, you know, over a decade ago, I had a customer who just sent me a uh, duct taped up trash bag. No return address, no nothing. It looked like someone had sent me a bomb, basically. And what it was, it was all of their expense receipts for the year. And I said, you can either pay me per hour a rather ridiculous rate to go through this, or you can take the time to get into the pattern monthly of keeping your own records, putting it in this nice little record book that we can give you, or an Excel, mm -hmm. something that helps make you a legitimate looking business, as well as just taking the time to actually figure out what's going on. Because in that instance, they had no idea if they were making money or not. And I would come to the end of the year with their tax return and we still weren't 100% sure because what if something was missing from the trash bag? You know, they went and they literally were checking the consoles of the truck, the glove compartments, you know, looking around for stuff, going through, taking hours of going through their credit card statements and their bank statements, trying to make sure we caught everything. And if you do a good job, like Sherry was saying, of doing it on a regular basis and going through, your life is going to be much easier and more relaxed at the end of the day than if you send someone like me a trash bag <laughs> and cheaper. That's true. And just like she said, it's, oh, yes, sir. One of the things that uh, Patty dealt with the IRS, uh, they really do not appreciate you coming in with a trash bag full of papers, uh, <laughs> receipts. And all. You, if, you wanna, if you have to go in, you want to have them all categorized and, and listed. Mm -hmm. And of course, QuickBooks are quick and helps too. Yeah. Uh, but they, uh, you start off on the wrong foot, big time. Yep. If you just oh, go sure. in the whole batch of papers, in a paper bag or something. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're also impressed <laughs> if you go in with things organized. That puts you kind of, they're looking at like, you know, ahead of the I game. Guess this person really is serious. Yep. But you, you definitely want to be. And yeah, with, oops, sorry, sure. with a lot of the softwares that are out there that can help you, you know, you'll see advertisements for QuickBooks or for Quicken, you know, you can take pictures of things on your phone and it automatically categorizes it. You know, a lot of those things are out there. There's also a lot of free varieties out there. So there's things mm -hmm. called cash flow, cash flow management, um, you know, and they're very much like made towards small businesses or growing businesses so that you have a way to record this information and continue to have that right footing to get started. Yeah. And what, what is the easiest, um, you know, whether it's a book or cash flow mm -hmm. for, you know, I'm yeah. not very good with QuickBooks. No, nope, that's, that's okay. I'm going to give the standard. I'm going to like a retarded person. I'm going to give the standard accountant answer of it depends. So, so I. I, I was going to say that. <laughs> My account yep. for 35 years is this quick, and I feel like it. Mm -hmm. right now. I would say that if that's the situation, start off doing it by hand. Get a notebook, even if it's just a spiral notebook, and label the top of each page a different account category. And every week or every month, go through and write down what the expenses were in those categories so that you're doing it at least that much. Um, I would say there's plenty of us professionals who, if we have a customer who comes to us and says, we need to do a better job of record keeping, we'll sit down and we'll go through and we'll do some training and do some, mm -hmm. you know, some assistance to figure out what helps. So I would say right now, probably the easiest to use softwares that are out there would be QuickBooks and Quicken. Um, QuickBooks Online is really kind of what's being pushed out there. Um, so basically you log into your account online and you start entering information in there. The nice part about that is you can actually invite an accountant or another person to look at it at the same time. So they can do a lot of sharing to help guide and to train you. Um, you know, otherwise typing things out in an Excel would be another option. Mm -hmm. I don't have great handwriting, so I do my stuff in Excel as well. So do I. Yeah. Um, and for my family's farm, we do everything on QuickBooks as well. So, you know, either option is good as long as you feel like you're organized and you can easily explain to your accountant, whoever you're using, this is what this stands for. This is all the repairs I paid for. This is all the farrier bills I paid for. This is all the vets, you know, so that's Warmer stuff like that. Categories, just specifically like that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Yep. And we say with Excel, I know my one friend was on Quick Online. She's like, ah, oh, that's so crazy. But for me, just using Excel, you can even start with that. You can take the sheets, make one sheet expenses. You can list everything that you did that and then do the next one and say this is the assets and do the income. Mm -hmm. And then if you do put it on QuickBooks, you have it so organized it's easier to put it in. Mm -hmm. I just, that's why I suggested to her as well, if you can start out simple and just like list everything and be able to just look at it, because I'm a visual person, I like to be able to look at everything and say, oh, these were my expenses, which can I categorize in and just kind of straighten it out that way then it might even be even easier for you to put into QuickBooks because you're like, here, this is this, and figure out what category it goes into. Yep. Yep. Anyone else have any questions? Sure. I think in regards to 1099s also, like mm -hmm. if you're giving them to your fair or your I mean, like who are you actually giving them to because you're mm -hmm. paying them? You know, we'll get to lot. that in a couple of minutes. Okay. Yep. We yep. have that. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. Is there any yep. other questions? Yep. Okay. And then we talked about, and we have an, uh, um, a scheduled F and a scheduled C. And there were, these are just like, scheduled F is for the farms, scheduled C is for small business. Um, and we talk about the different expenses. And we'll get more into it with that, just to make sure everybody has one. This is the easiest way. That's why it's important to have all your expenses and all your income together, because when you look at it, it's just so much easier to fill out. Then you'll know what is what. If you have an expense, I don't know, maybe you bought something at the farm store, but you have no idea what it was, it's nice to have that receipt that'll tell you exactly what it is. You can see if it's deductible, see if it's an expense you can use. Some of the things that we have, think about it, like your feed, your repairs, your supplies, your vet, the farrier. Try to be specific. Like if you use a supply, I bought this particular thing for this particular reason, for this particular horse or a trailer or whatever it happens to be, so that when we look at it, we can say this expense is deductible because you used it for this specific thing. As, he, as you said, the more specific you are, the easier it is for you to know exactly where it is and for your account and you to know whether it's deductible, what category to put it in, and such. And so the reason we passed out the Schedule F and the Schedule C, so hopefully everyone got, there's two papers, so hopefully you got the two of them. They're your starting points to figure out your actual income and expenses. So as you think about your day-to-day -day operation, you know, you have a feed cost, you have a repair cost. You'll see on the Schedule F, there's a line for repairs, there's a line for feed. You know, you'll also see that there's a line for vet there. You know, that would be shots, your Coggins, your Wormer, you know, all of that stuff that comes related to it. Um, you know, those are good categories to start off with. And then if you're not sure what it goes into, have an other account, um, you know, to kind of still keep yourself organized and then to say, here's the ones where I don't know where they go into, but make a note just like you would on a memo and a check that you're writing or a note to yourself to say, I bought this, you know, broom specifically to uh, clean off the cobwebs in the barn, you know, mm -hmm. just so we can try and help guide then where it should actually go in your records. Yeah. And then F is for the farm, schedule F, and this is for small business. So there's a distinct difference between the two. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, this is for small business and then F is for farm. And it's, isn't it, it's, 10 acres for the farm? Like that's so one of the specifics? The Schedule F would be specifically to you have a farming operation where you are breeding, you're doing something like raising livestock for meat, resale, something like that, um, or you have a large amount of acreage that you're producing something off of that acreage and that land. Um, you know, the Schedule C would be more like my stewarding, my judging. I'm putting that on a Schedule C because I'm not raising or breeding or doing something specific with my horse. Um, you know, if you have a boarding facility or a lesson facility, you could put that on a Schedule F, um, you know, as long as that's kind of your main operation and things going on there. Mm -hmm. so, yep. so, so, do you have any questions about the difference or anything so far? Going good? Mm-hmm. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Correct. Next, we're talking about accounts to tax deductions. These are the ones we talked about, the employee expense versus custom hire. 
That's what we talked about W-2s versus 1099s. It depends. Custom hire will always be a 1099. Employee expense, some employees like to do W-2. Some of them like to do 1099. I mean, it's just, it, mm -hmm. we prefer W-2, of course, but there's always that instance. We always have special. Depreciation of land, maintenance, and improvements. We had that discussion today about when's a good time to do certain depreciations, how much you want to depreciate. Uh, subscriptions, licensing, professional fees. If you're fostering animals or service animals, you can deduct expenses that incur to you while you're doing those things. Your insurances that you have to have for the farm and the other things in day-to-day -day operations. Meals and travel expenses. If you're taking a horse to a certain spot and you're using it specifically for business, you can deduct those sort of things. Marketing, marketing your horses, your riding lessons, those sort of things, you can always deduct all of those. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about that employee expense versus that 1099, so um, something to remember there is if you are telling that person what to do on your property to get something done, that is technically an employee and you should be giving them a W-2 withholding taxes at the end of the day. Someone that you're giving a 1099 to, so getting to your point, is you can't do the job yourself. So you are hiring a third party to come in and do it. You're merely hiring them. You're not telling them what to do. They're specialized in that trade. They're specialized in that operation and they're doing it for you. So the rule is if you have kind of that description, if you pay that person $600 or more for the entire year, you should be sending them a 1099. So if you have a farrier coming uh, every six weeks, you know, and they're shoeing and they're doing something for you, if you've paid them over $600 throughout the year, so January through December, you should be sending them a 1099 at the end of the day. Um, another good example of that instance would be if you have, say you own your own hay fields and you pay someone to come in and bale the, that hay, you've paid that person more than $600 throughout the year, you would want to send them a 1099 for the service that they've done for you. Um, the vet can kind of get a little hairy. A lot of veterinary offices are incorporated. If they're incorporated, you don't necessarily need to send that, but you still wanna keep track. Did you pay them over $600 for their services throughout the year and send them a 1099? Oh. Yeah. Just give a general direction mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to being specific from what I've been told, you know, say, you know, come, and you, like I said, you can't schedule them for hours and days, but if they come <coughs> and, let's say, they come to uh, do some work fixing a fence or something, but you, as long as you don't, from what I understand, if you don't say that fence right down there needs three new boards or something, when you, they come in and look at the place and kind of on their own, mm -hmm. almost like an independent contractor in there, going to go out and check everything and fix, oh, I found this, I found that. And from what I've been told, that's covered. You know, you can 1099. But if, they're, if you're going to tell them specifically what to do, mm -hmm. then they're the W-2. It depends. Okay. <laughs> yep, it depends. So, and the reason it depends, not only because it's my favorite answer, but uh, the guidelines continue to get more and more specific from the IRS. So it's not just about what instruction you give a person, it is about do they meet certain criteria? Are you providing all of the things that they need to get that job done, W-2 employee? Are you telling them when they can and cannot come? So not so much what hours they're available to come, but this is the week that you can come. Here are the days that you can come, W-2 employee. Um, if you are giving them a list of things that they need to accomplish by the end of the week or by that day, it could say something as general as fix fences, W-2 employee. Um, so the rules are very much in line of more W-2 employee than just 1099. Um, and the reason for that is, is one of the audits you never want to get pulled for is a 1099 specific audit. Because what will happen is, is they will come in, they'll ask to look at your records, they'll ask if you sent 1099s, and they will compare your records to who you sent 1099s to. And if they find that someone's missing, you can have a fine up to, 
I believe it's $200 for not sending that, as well as you might have to pay the back taxes if they decide that a 1099 you sent should have been a W-2 employee. So it's very much, you really want to think about, am I giving them instruction not only about what I want them to accomplish, but how they need to accomplish it and provide tools for them to accomplish it. So it always kind of depends. So. Does anyone else have any other questions? And then we're two questions. Is any yeah. question you have about taxes, we yeah. are more than happy to help. Go ahead. Um, so <coughs> when you are doing the deduction, So to kind of summarize, you have been running this as a business, you realize that it's not really a going concern, which means like, you know, it's not really working out, so we need to stop and we need to do something. But we had bought a tractor three years ago and we were depreciating it over a period of time. Um, basically what happens is if it's, it depends on what kind of business structure you have. So if you're a corporation versus just a sole proprietor, there can be some differences there. But in general, basically what happens is we say, okay, this means that you don't get to write anything off anymore. You basically are shut down. We need to, you know, if you've registered under the state of Maryland or you've registered as a business, we need to let them know that you're done as a, as a business. Um, and then if you were to say, you know, we close down, 10 years later down the road, we're giving it another go, another college try, you can't start that depreciation for those assets over again. Basically, you have to treat it as, we bought that tractor 10 years ago, there's no more deductions to it in terms of depreciation, and we're just using it in the farm. There's no deduction to it. You know, you can still take things like the fuel, the repairs, you know, those daily expenses to it, but you don't get to take that $50,000 you originally bought it for and start over deducting that $50,000 10 years later. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. So those are kind of the things that you would want to make sure that you look at if you stop and then start, start again. How about yeah. if you did depreciate it down to zero? Nope. Doesn't matter. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Yep, so say we have that $50,000 tractor that starts and um, we have $20,000 of depreciation left and we realize we need to close. You have that same tractor 10 years later. You have to pretend as if, you know, it was down to zero in the first place and just start from there. You say 10 years, but say it's a year or mm -hmm. so you've got like a stop gap kind of mm -hmm. time period. Yep, yep. So if it was a year, if it was a year, you pause for that year, what your accountant should do is say, okay, you didn't take this deduction for one year. They should calculate it as though you did and then continue on. Yep. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Yep. Did you have a question in the back? Oh, I okay. thought you had a question. I have one. Sure. About workman's compensation. Mm. Okay. Yeah. A specific question or just kind of well, in general. This is about employees that don't get compensation. Right. So another thing with 1099s is they're not covered. Um, so if you have people working on your farm or working at your barn and they are W-2 employees, you're required by Maryland law to have workers' compensation insurance. If you have someone that you're giving a 1099, they get hurt your liability umbrella coverage, if you will, is what you have to look at. And you have to make sure that you have good insurance in that situation. And so um, workers' comp only exists for those people who have W-2 wages. Yep. Yep. If you're licensed in Maryland as an owner or trainer, mm -hmm. uh, that's required that you have mm -hmm. workers' comp, I mean, you don't have a choice no decision to be made there. Yep. 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 Other questions? Anyone else? 
Okay. Okay. Well, if you do think of anything, uh, Sherry and I's emails are up here. You can email both of us. Um, Horizon Farm Credit covers Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, and parts of Virginia. Um, and business services, which is what Sherry and I fall under, is just entering the state of Maryland. Um, so Sherry is out of our Bel Air office, and I work with her on a very regular basis. Um, mm -hmm. So feel free to reach out and ask questions. Um, you know, soon we'll be taking on the full business of doing accounting services, whether it be record keeping, payroll, consulting, tax preparation. Um, we're busy right now doing tax returns for 2023, so that's why we started off with all those dates because that's what's running through our mind constantly. Um, but yeah, but I mean, there's a lot of agriculture expertise across our team, no matter what industry you're in. If it's equestrian, dairy, poultry, you know, we have a lot of people who are mixed, um, and we're happy to answer questions and be a resource for you. Now. I saw up there that it said the Schedule F, I mean the court pass or whatever, mm -hmm. has to be done by March 15th. I never realized that. And my accountants have never... It's sort of a, it's a new rule, so it started about five years ago. Um, and a lot of times what happens is, is you don't have all your information quite ready to gather together, so you can file an automatic extension that's at no special cost to your business. And then you have until you know April fifteenth or to September fifteenth to get the whole thing filed. So, but, but I have to file an extension if I, if I'm an S court by March fifteenth. Mm -hmm. And your accountant probably takes care of it, and that's why you probably never knew. Yeah. Well, yeah. Now yeah. I don't know. Yep. Yep. So, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, okay. Uh, thank you.